바람의 감초 햇볕의 따스함 그녀는 보이지 않는 것들을 붙잡아 향기로 만들죠. 조 말론 유명 향수 브랜드 맞습니다. 창업자의 이름이기도 하죠. I didn't just take nice neat little fragrances and put them in a bottle. I took things that collided. I took things that were aggressive and then soft all at the same time. 좁은 부엌에서 시작해 세계적인 브랜드를 무려 두 개나 성공시켰습니다. 자랑스러운 영국인으로 훈장도 두 번이나 받았죠. 뭐가 달랐을까요? 이름 없는 향수 가게를 글로벌 브랜드로 쏘아올린 비밀. 지금 공개합니다. 안녕하세요. with four plastic jugs, a saucepan, and a whole heap of dreams. And I think the very, very first one I made was, uh, it was geranium, strawberry, or like a wild strawberry note and violet. And I would blend them together. And the great thing about perfumer is finding ways that you can lock really different notes together. So that was the very first one. It didn't smell as good as I wanted it. And so I would take it and I would, you know, almost like playing a piano, add notes in, take notes out, give a beat to the fragrance and find it. And uh, I created a wonderful wild strawberry note from that. So the fragrances that I created, I would just make by hand, fill by hand and sell them to my consumers that would come to have their skins done and their faces done. Because I was a beautician in the very beginning and everybody, loved the product and there was this buzz about everything that we did and one lady one day bought 100 bottles it was amazing i sat in, stood in the kitchen filled them all by hand labeled them and they sat at a place at a party that she was holding and within one month 86 out of 100 people were desperate to buy the product they thought it was a really big full-on brand but it wasn't it was all being made in my kitchen with four plastic jugs and a little saucepan and a whole heap of dreams. But those 100 people grew and grew and grew until the point where my husband Gary and I, who were business partners, as well as husband and wife and best friends, we decided to open our first little shop in 154 Walton Street. It was a tiny 350 square feet store. It was a concrete block, there was nothing in it. And as I opened the door, I saw the vision of the store that I wanted to create. Within six weeks, we were open, and it was opening day. The Financial Times, a newspaper in the UK, had printed that we were open 48 hours earlier than we were meant to be. So that night, my husband and I were in the store, painting the shelves, drying it with hair dryers to try and get the paint to dry before the morning. I put all the merchandise on the store, closed the door and knew the next morning that we would open the door and we would be shopkeepers for the first time. Nine o'clock, I got to the store in 154 Walton Street and there was a long queue all the way down the street waiting for us to open our doors. It was just so, so exciting. Opened the door and in we went and we started trading within minutes. Unfortunately, it took a while because all the paint had dried overnight and all the bottles were stuck to the shelves. So there we were with screwdrivers trying to get everything off of the shelves. So from day one of opening 154 Walton Street, 
we saw everybody was totally captivated by the products that we were creating. And every day I would sit and I would look at the figures that we were bringing in and every day, it might have only been one pound or one penny, but not one day did we drop below the previous day. It was an incredible moment of growth. So that the big guys who had the big corporations were looking and thinking, we have all this money, we have all these people, we have all this power, but this woman is creating fragrances that are changing the world in a kitchen. What has she got and how do we replicate it? So when I first started out, um, one of the fragrances I created was nutmeg and ginger and no one had ever used nutmeg and ginger together and then called it that. I think that was the really kind of unique uh, selling point of it or lime, basil and mandarin. But someone said, no one is ever going to buy a fragrance with those ingredients in, especially not basil. Because basil has this aniseed twist with it, which, which can turn a fragrance either way. Well, funny. I created it, and they did. And it became known as the pension fund, because it sold 40 times more than anything else. So picking those different ingredients and using them and placing them in a setting, in a creative setting, where they actually sometimes, they would clash, they would fight together. I didn't just take nice, neat little fragrances and put them in a bottle and expect it to sell. I took things that collided, I took things that were aggressive and then soft all at the same time. Um, and it, it worked and it captivated and really challenged people's creativity. Great minds. Joe, hello. See you one. I grew up in a family with uh, we had very little money. We were we lived on what is a, what is known as a council estate, where the government helped fund uh, accommodation in your home. So we lived in a little two bedrooms, little tiny kitchen, sitting room downstairs, and that was my childhood. I had two incredibly creative parents. So my father was a brilliant artist and architect. So that's where I suppose I learned my creativity from. And he was also a brilliant magician. And I was the magician's assistant. So my jobs at the weekend were to go to the market with my father and sell his paintings. Uh, to be the magician's assistant, I would look after all the white rabbits that appeared out of hats and doves. My mum was in the beauty industry, so she worked for an amazing woman called the Countess Lubati. And she was six foot tall, blonde hair, blood red lipstick, beauty, I mean, beautiful woman. And my mum worked for her. So between my two parents, I would have the storytelling of my father and I would have the love that would develop all the way through my life of the beauty industry. Um, so when I was a child, one of the first fragrances I created was this little, like many children do, that little bottle of rose petals. I'd love to think that there was huge amounts of inspiration, but there wasn't. We just had a big garden with lots of rose trees and they were like country roses and they, and when they're blown, they had this amazing kind of sweet, almost like an apricot honey smell to them. And I just wanted to pick the roses and capture it forever and ever and ever. But of course, that's not how you create fragrance um, the very first time. But I did gather the rose petals, put them into, I remember putting them into hot water and smelling them. But of course, the minute you pick something natural and you try and capture its scent, it runs away. And of course it did. And it took many years for me to learn how to capture the scent of a rose and keep it in a bottle. So when I first start creating a fragrance, it's a whole long journey, but it starts out with that inspiration. Something will stop me dead in my tracks. That inspiration and that innovation, those two things are best friends, they hold hands the whole time. So I'm inspired by something and it might be, it might be a beach, it might be a blue sky, it might be um, a butterfly that's just flown by, it might be just watching a person, watching their mannerisms and their characteristics. So that's where it starts. 
And then my mind starts to build a story. And it doesn't build it with words, it builds it with fragrant notes. That's what happens. So I start to see, I start to see people and life in fragrance notes. I'm able to translate back and I'm able to see color in fragrance as well. It's a really, um, it's, uh, the older I've got, the more amazing I know this, the gift that I've been given. It's called synesthesia. So you actually see color, but I smell fragrance. So I'm able to start painting a picture or hearing a beat, like in a piece of music. And what do I want that, what do I want that note to be? Do I want it to be cedarwood, really softly, or do I want it bold and, and kind of shouting through? Do I want that really sort of grainy vetiver? Or do I want just wonderful light notes just floating by? Is it orange blossom? Is it nearly? So I start to piece together this piece of poetry, this piece of music. I feel the beat. I feel the, the message of the fragrance. And then I start piecing together. And then I look down my big telescope in the fragrance. Rather like, um, you know, when you were a child and you had a kaleidoscope and you would look down and you would move the thing and it, all the pieces would jumble around. That's how, what I do. I look down my telescope and I look at all the pieces. And then I look for the holes in the fragrance. And then I think, it needs something there. It needs something there. It needs something there. What is it that it needs? And that's when the, that's when the part of Joe really comes to the surface. And then I start to fill those holes. And then I smell. And I take it and then I smell and I do that for days and days and days and when I get to the point where I get to the 14, 21, 30 days and I smell the paper and I see no more holes, I know it's ready. I think one of the things that people recognize most about me when I'm creating fragrance, what is the signature of Joe? And I always start when I'm first creating a fragrance, one of the things I'm known for is that platform of wood that everything sits on. So that is often, I will know the big picture where I want to be, but I start with the platform of wonderful woody notes so that everything can be held in place. So when we create a fragrance, you can often, you'll often hear the expression, a pyramid, a fragrance pyramid. And they're often used for training purposes. And that pyramid, if you break that pyramid into three sections, you have top notes, middle notes, and bottom notes. The top notes are giving you the first effect. So when you spray a fragrance onto your skin, the first thing you smell are those top notes. And they're often, they often disappear sort of quite quickly, but they really give that lasting impression. Then you get what we call the heart of the fragrance, the bit that beats, the bit that as the fragrance dries down, you start to smell those wonderful creative notes. But what will hold a fragrance on your skin is those base woody notes. So what I do is I take those, that little platform at the bottom and I place it through each part of the fragrance. So for instance, one thing that I'm noted for is citrus notes. People know I create cle really clean, crisp citrus notes. But in order to hold that grapefruit or that bergamot or that wonderful lime, I've got little platforms of wood all the way through that pyramid so that you can feel the citrus. So something like Joe by Joe Loves, you can feel that citrus or the spine of citrus all the way through that fragrance. And I think that's what people recognize as my signature. Every perfumer I know, whenever they start to create a fragrance, they're looking to create a masterpiece. That's what we all want to do. We want to change the world. We want to find a note that no one has used before. Or we want to create, I mean, certain parts of the world, you will find, you will find notes that, that people love. Like for instance, if we are in the Far East, it's those wonderful clean citrus notes and those light florals. Uh, if you move to the Middle East, it's those deep, rich, you know, with the deep voice and those wonderful ouds and spices and things that linger. Uh, Europe is much more, the, again, the, the blossoms, um, but again, the cleanest. And we can see that each generation comes along and each generation is asking perfumers to create in different ways. And so it's a, an incredibly exciting time. Hello? See you in one day one. 
Well, a man walked through my doorway once, and he was called Leonard Lauder. He was the son of the amazing Estee Lauder. And the minute I met Leonard, I knew I'd met somebody who had a similar heart and passion for the beauty industry. He'd also been where we'd been. He'd started with nothing with his mother. He asked if I'd be interested in an acquisition and for Estee Lauder Corporations to buy the company. Who wouldn't? I remember going home that night and knowing if I made that call and that decision, my life would change and Gary and I would be in a whole different setting. I thought about it for a long time. I let the negotiations go backwards and forwards. And when you're selling a business or buying a business, you know what, don't be too much of a hurry to get it done because that is what you're inheriting, all of those things. It's not just about the check that comes at the end of it. That was very healthy and very nice. Thank you very much. I signed a deal that would keep me there in the corporation for as long as I wanted for the rest of my life. And I was so happy. I was traveling the world. I was creating skincare product and fragrances. I had never been so happy. I just had a little boy and he was just born. I was just 38 years old. But do you know something in life, sometimes you get curveballs. You don't deserve them, you don't ask for them, and they're a bit of a shock when they land on your doorstep. Mine was about to come from a direction I didn't anticipate. It was called cancer. I was diagnosed with breast cancer and I was given nine months to live. I was just 38 years old. One palm of my hand, I had everything and the other just been taken away. And all I cared about at that moment was not nutmeg and ginger or lime, basil and mandarin or even Leonard Lauder. I looked at my son and my husband. I wondered if I'd ever see him grow up. Would I see him get married, go to university, do all the things that normal families have? Or was my life gonna be at an end? I made a call to the amazing Evelyn Lauder, the wife of Leonard Lauder. I asked her for help. And within 24 hours, I'd flown to New York City to have treatment. Was I gonna last for nine months? Well, you can see the, the evidence sitting before you. I did survive it. But I was one of the first women to take this really intensive chemotherapy. What I did realize is I had a chance of getting my life back. What I didn't realize, it would take my sense of smell. I never told a soul. I made my way through all the treatment, all the chemotherapy, all the reconstruction. And then the day came when my doctor said, Joe, the cancer has gone today. Go and live your life. And I flew back to London. I hadn't told anyone I couldn't smell. Back to work, back to the shop, but I knew something deep within me had gone. I was just Joe. I made that decision within a few months that I was to leave Joe Malone London. And I know a lot of you watching this are gonna be really shocked because you still think I'm there, but I'm not. I left many, many, many years ago. And the build up to all of that was quite intensive. You can imagine this emotional connection that I had with a business. It wasn't just a brand to me, it was my life. It was my best friend. And as we came to that last week of when all the deal had been signed, I had agreed to a five year lockout the business was seen safe hands with Estee Lauder. Everyone's job was guaranteed. That last seven days, I felt I'd made the biggest mistake of my life. What had I done? I was walking away from something. My sense of smell still hadn't returned, but this business entrepreneur within me was nearly bursting out saying, please stop, I've made a mistake, I wanna go back, but I didn't. I was the last person to turn the key in the lock on Sloane Street, and I walked away. And I didn't go near any department store, any fragrance shop, anything for five years. 
because it absolutely broke me inside that I made a huge mistake. Just again, one more lesson to learn. Never make a life-changing decision on a bad day. Why? Because the landscape can often change very, very quickly, and it did. If you do make a bad decision on a bad day, don't worry, because landscapes change all the time. And if I hadn't done that and moved on, I would never be sitting here talking to you now, because the adventure continued. The industry and the perfume industry were suddenly, there were the big guys, there were the ones in the middle, and then there were these niche fragrance brands. And the niche fragrance brands were doing things so creatively and so differently. I knew I had to do something that absolutely captivated everyone's imagination within a second. I had to kiss the consumer for the first time. I had to make them remember who Joe loves is and who Joe Malone is and how on earth was I going to do that with a very small budget. And so as I stood there, I came up with this crazy idea. And I looked at Gary and I said, we're going to build a tapas bar in here. And he put his head in his hands and he went, you've got to be joking, Joe. You've got to be kidding. And I went, no, we're going to create a tapas bar where you don't eat anything but it's only for your sense of smell. But the tapas bar does sit in Elizabeth Street now, and it is our first kiss with the consumer. Joe Malone, scene one, take one. I was walking down the beach early one morning, all by myself. I would do it every day to try and calm my mind and tell my anxiety it was okay, everything was gonna work out as it normally does. And as I walked down the beach, I saw a baby stingray in the water. And Parrot Key, the island I was on, is behind a coral reef, so there's no real kind of heavy waves. And this baby stingray was just following me down the beach, swimming in the water. And when I stopped, the stingray stopped. And I looked and I was so, I was so transfixed by nature trying to teach me something and tell me. Walked down to the edge of the beach and I came back and then I suddenly realised what it was all about. We don't own creativity, we never did. It doesn't belong to you or me. But creativity is an energy that wants to collaborate with you and me. And sometimes when something whispers in your ear, that inspiration, using your imagination, that's where creativity wants to engage. And that happened to me that morning walking along the beach. I looked up and I saw blue skies. I saw big white sand dollars in the sand. The stingray had, sw had swum off long before. There was a glass of fizzy water with a slice of lime. I could smell the broth cooking for lunch in the background in the brasserie. And I saw white rolled towels. And I took every single thing I saw and I created a note for every single moment. And that fragrance is called pomelo. The smell of white beaches, the smell of sand dollars. But it's more than that. It's the smell of hope. It's the smell of a second chance at something you love. So pomelo is this wonderful citrus note with such a strong spirit. Those citrus notes never disappear and they never go. And Pomelo was the first fragrance for Joe Loves and has remained in the top three in everything we have done in all the years since across the world. Isn't that amazing? I've always, I think, been a scent storyteller. It's, it's the thing that I do. I see life, I feel life, and then I translate everything back into my own little world of fragrant notes. And I take those fragrant notes as though they're words or music, and I piece them together. But when you create scent stories, I mean, listen, round the world, it doesn't matter who you are, what age you are, where you come from, how much money you have or you don't have, people love stories. Why? Because they make them feel alive. And stories connect us on a human level. And that humanity and that being able to, to draw from my life 
and share my life with you and then take it from somebody else. And each one of my fragrances, Pomelo is the Turks and Caicos. Smoke Plum and Leather is riding my horse in the mountains in Montana. Mango and Thai Lime is New York City and sitting there at a bar and watching the hustle and bustle. Every single one has a story. And the great thing about it is when we go around the world and we share those stories, and I go and talk about creativity and sense stories all the way around the world, what happens? People engage. People then take three steps towards you and your brand and say, I want a memory, I want a scent story. So, okay, is it to find a scent for your wedding? Is it to find a scent for your grandmother? Do you know one of the most moving stories I had sent to me? I'd never met the person, but the fragrance that she used when her grandmother was dying was a beautiful fragrance that I had created. And she remembers scenting her sheets in that last bit of the ceremony in the chapter of her life. She said, whenever I smell it now, I think of the life of my grandmother. And it brought me to tears. I mean, how amazing to be there when a child is born, when you're having your wedding, when you've got a Sunday lunch party, but to say goodbye to someone as well. It's that last kind of love letter that you can give them. Very special. You know, the human needs to survive. We're looking at, you need shelter. You need food, you need to be clothed. Is fragrance as important as that? The answer to that is no, of course not. But the sense of taste and the sense of smell bring color to our lives. If we didn't have, if you meet people that can't smell and taste and it, it kind of dulls a lot of the experience, it feels kind of quite black and white. What fragrance does is it brings color and it brings depth and it brings imagination and it brings that, you know, the part of your, of your brain that sits with memory and the sense of smell sit really, really close together. So when you smell something, and it might be your grandmother's garden or it might be a wedding day, it might be the day that your child went to school for the very first time and came home and had just that, that sort of slight smell in their hair that scent then locks itself in your memory. And when you smell that, you're transported through time and place and feelings. And suddenly you start to evoke those feelings again. So, hello? Scene one, take one. So I think, how does, how does scent enrich human life. I just think it brings colour, it brings dimension, it brings emotion. You kind of, it, you know, when you think of our lives, um, I remember when my son was born and he was put in my arms for the first time and I had been so sick having him. I had something called hyperemesis. And uh, so I was really, really poorly. And the minute he was put in my arms and I remember smelling my, just the smell of a, of a newborn baby. There isn't, I can't capture it, I can't create it, I've tried, I can't do it. It just doesn't exist. And there are certain smells that just bring that, that sense of humanness. And in the last two years during the pandemic, people have looked at their four walls and their homes. They've been their schoolrooms, their cinemas, their gyms, their restaurants, their place of work. And you can't change it. You can't change the way four walls look, but if you change the fragrance, the whole persona of that living space changes. You can bring the outdoors indoors, the indoors outdoors. Each floor can have a different smell. You can have that sense. I remember when my son was really tiny and we would travel a lot on planes and go from time zone to time zone. And from the, when he first came home, I would create a cologne that I've never sold, and, it, and we still use it at home, and it was just a tiny bit, and I would put it onto his pajamas when he went to bed, and it was just a tiny bit. But from a very, very young age, he learned that that smell meant sleep. So when we got onto a plane, I'd put his pajamas on, touch his pajamas with this really light sort of citrusy, it's like a really, really fine orange cologne, not heavy in any way, and he'd immediately know that it was sleep time. And guess what went with him to university? A bottle of sleep cologne. 
So the power of smell can be so much more than just a nice scent to put behind our ears or on our wrists. So as I've explained, scent to me is not just something I smell. It's a language, it's a means of communication. I'm, I'm telling you stories of my life through the power of the sense of smell and notes. And I look at each note as though it has a character and a personality. Um, for instance, orange blossom makes me smile. Grapefruit makes me feel like I could do anything in the world. And oud and vetiver just mean strong, strength, character notes. The smell of bergamot oil, the smell of limes and lemons, that citrus, often a very cologne-type smell that brings cleanness. People often, which is why people love it in uh, home care, is because that smell of cleanness it makes you, makes you just feel just kind of relaxed and not too heady. So I think one of the, the, the sense, um, senses of smell is the sense of home, isn't it? All of our homes have a smell to them. So my home smells of pomelo. I have all white wooden floors and I wash, they're washed every day with a very, very dilute pomelo. And when I walk in, I can smell home. And a few years ago, we had a terrible fire in our house and our, and our house burnt down. And we left with literally the clothes we were standing in and we had to go and live somewhere else. And my son, again, was going off to school and he said, Mom, I'm so, so sad, I miss my home, I, I don't want to go to school. And I said, darling, go to school and I promise you when you come home, this will feel like home. And we'd rented an apartment. He went out and I went and got as many bottles of pomelo as I could find and I washed this house from top to bottom. Went to pick him up from school, he was only seven and he walked through the door and he went, it smells of home, mum. And so pomelo yet again comes to the rescue. But I think the smell of our home is a really important, it, not everyone's smell, home smells of pomelo, but you'll have, you might be your garden, it might be, your mom or your other half cooking in the kitchen. It might be the smell of Sunday lunch. It might be the smell of Christmas morning with the Christmas tree. There's just, your home is an encyclopedia of all kinds of different smells. And I think that is one of the most important life enhancing and life security feelings that we have, the sense and the smell of home. The sense of smell isn't about something that's in a bottle. It's so much more than that. And if we start to explore that sense of smell, we'll start to understand other cultures and other people. And it, what we'll find is it brings us together. And I am all for finding things that bring everyone together and hearing everyone's story. And can you imagine if we told all the stories in life through the sense of smell, there would be far much more that unites us than divides us. Show Malone, scene one, take one. So I'd like to welcome you all to the Tapas Bar in Joe Loves here in Elizabeth Street. But before we go on to Tapas and this, these wonderful kind of uh, stories I'm going to tell you, let me tell you first that the story of Elizabeth Street. So this was given to me on my birthday, a little box with a key in it. And I came down, put the key in the lock. And as I walked in, it was so amazing because what I realised that the gift I'd just been given for my birthday by my husband was in fact the shop where I'd had my first job in at 16. And this was a delicatessen owned by an incredible man called Justin de Blanc. There were fridges over here and a wonderful counter. But here I discovered my love of food and the sense of taste and the sense of smell. It's funny sometimes, isn't it, that life will bring you full circle and take you back to where you first started. When I first walked through the door here, and I realized I'd been here before, I knew that this was the home for Joe Loves. Creativity doesn't understand time. It doesn't get stuck in a place. Creativity is timeless. And I could feel all those emotions that I'd felt as a child back here in that shop. And then what was I gonna do? And I came up with this idea 
and here it is. So this is a little tapas bar. Not to eat, nothing to taste, only to smell. So fragrance to me is a whole language, that's a whole means from another sense to be able to communicate my creativity to you. Well, as you can see, I got my way, as always, in creativity. And here is a big J bar in the middle of the store. And this is the first brasserie tapas bar for your nose in the world. Uh, we go around the world and we teach people how to look at fragrance differently. So I thought it would be really great and fun today for us to go through tapas together. I know you can't smell anything, but hopefully at the end of this, your imagination would have created the sense of smell before you. So we're going to start with a bath cologne. And as you can see, this is a tagine. It belongs in the kitchen, doesn't it? What are you doing, Joe? Well, we're going to be a little creative here. We're going to get one of these wonderful products. This is a bath cologne, and it is it's a really, really high level of fragrance. And I used to love pouring just neat cologne in the bath. I love the smell as it diffused. So I created a bath cologne. The fragrance I start the day with. And I'm going to pour a little bit on to the cotton wool. And then I'm going to take a shot glass. Put a wonderful shot of this delicious grapefruit in. And in that goes. So imagine this just going into your bath. I'm going to take some warm water. Pour it over the top. And then I'm going to seal it with the lid. And I'm just going to take it and swirl. And then as the consumer is sitting there, we just lift the lid. Now, I know you can't smell it, but pretend you can. Imagine a citrus grove. Imagine just the skin of, of beautiful sort of pink grapefruit, ruby grapefruit, pomelos, all of those citrus notes. And then what you do is you get this wonderful hot steam. And you smell right Oh my God, that all of those lovely grapefruit, pomelo, limes, all of those citrus notes, it's like a meze of fresh, wonderful grapefruit. So I'm often asked, how, Joe, how do I find what's right for me? Well, do you know what? Fragrance is like art. I can't tell you what's right for you, only you know that. But there are a few simple rules that make it much easier. So you look at what you love. Do you like cologne and citrus, like limes and bergamot and, and fresh herbs? Or do you like a heavy, rich floral, like white roses, camellia, gardenias, tuberose? Do you like the smell of fresh white blossoms or spicy leathery notes? That will tell us what family you're more likely to lean towards. But remember, sometimes when you can use a fragrance that is a very rich, spice with frankincense, myrrh, cinnamon and ginger, and you want that little tiny bit of citrus. Remember, it's so easy to accessorize your fragrance and paint that little bit of sweetness or citrus in. So what you can do is accessorize your fragrance, just like you would fashion an address and put cufflinks on or earrings. You can do exactly the same with a fragrance by taking some of the notes that you really enjoy and putting them in to the fragrance that you love. So when you come into store, we teach you how to wear fragrance. And of course, the way that we've all been brought up is spray your wrists, spray your neck. I'm saying look at your body as though it's a canvas. Have fun with fragrance. It's so much more. When you spray, don't ever rub and it's something that every single person does. And what happens is by you, by you rubbing, you heat up the fragrance and you burn that top note that I was talking about and you need that top note to develop into the heart of the fragrance. So when you buy a fragrance, you want it to last. So I'm often asked, where do I store it? 
Fragrance does not like light or heat. Those are the two things that will erode it really, really quickly and it'll take away. Sometimes if you've had a bottle standing for a long time and you smell it and it just doesn't smell the same anymore. What I would say is fragrance is not meant to be um, kept for years and years and years. It's meant to be used and enjoyed. That's what it's meant. So I would say over a year, you probably need to look at a new fragrance. But when you store a fragrance, keep it in the dark. So keep it somewhere, put it into a cupboard and keep it somewhere cool. I often put my scents into the fridge and that does actually keep them uh, lasting longer and smelling. But it's also wonderful in the heat of the summer to take a bottle of ice cold cologne and then just spray it on you. It really refreshes um, and of course it keeps the life of the fragrance as well.